Hello again, everyone. Uh, this is Manos Brilakis from uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute, Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's um, lunch symposium from, uh, supported by CSI. Uh, also participating are Dr. Sadir Shroff from University of Illinois in Chicago and Dr. Ziad Ali from Columbia University in New York. Welcome, guys. Hey. And uh, before we get started, actually discussing about uh, optimal treatment of complex lesions and calcification, maybe we we'll spend a few minutes just to discuss the state of recovery. I know New York uh, was hit pretty hard. I'm not sure how Chicago is doing right now, but uh, maybe if um, uh, Ziad, if you want to kick it off, how things are going with you and uh, how are things going on in New York right now? Are you guys full capacity? What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Manos. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So actually, uh, today's my first outpatient clinic which in person. So that's why I'm like this. Um, uh, so we had about, you know, three or four months where we blocked everything. We started doing procedures just after Memorial Day, and we're slowly ramping up. Um, we've sort of accepted COVID as a part of life now in New York. Um, all of our patients are COVID tested before they come to the cath lab. If patients are COVID positive, they go into a COVID positive room um, and that is terminally clean. They usually try to make them the last patients of the day. But uh, you know, we, we definitely suffer the consequences. I had a few patients die on the waiting list um, because they weren't willing to come into the hospital, unfortunately. So and it's a similar issue. Yeah, people are, I think the patients are still very afraid to make it to the hospital for good or for bad reasons. Um, uh, Adir, how are things in Chicago? Are you having similar issues? Are you guys back to full uh, full time? Yeah, no, we've been back to full time for about three to four weeks now, and um, it's been really quite good. We started, you know, we just like everybody else, we had closed down all electives, all of our clinic, but we were we were doing once a week cohort clinic. So the interventional group, we'd have one in person clinic a day. So any of our interventional patients that needed to be seen in person, one of us would go and see that one one time. So really, once a month, we had clinic each of us. And now we're back to full, for the past three weeks, we've been back to full clinic. Um, but, you know, I have to say that I probably see half my patients are in person and half my patients are telehealth. So that's been a lot of, a lot of typing, a lot of phone calling, trying to really be, you know, people, when they're at home, they really expect to be called right on time. There's no waiting room. And I'm calling people, they're on boats, they're in rehab hospitals, they're in the car. They're, you know, in the park. Like I'm calling people all over, having clinic visits. It's, it's really incredible. Well, um, here it's okay when you call from your boat, man. I, I wish I had a boat. <laughs> I, I wish I had a boat. So no, it's been quite good. I mean, we're worried a little bit. We are COVID testing everybody that comes in. If they're COVID positive, they they go home, and then we have them wait for two weeks, and they get tested again. Then they have to get two negative tests in order to to come back. And so that's been working out okay for us, unless they're unstable or if they have an acute issue yeah. then we obviously cat them um, and we found we've had a quite a number of patients that come that are asymptomatic positive so it's been useful for us to do that screening and the hospital so been very supportive of that maybe i can ask you guys a quick question because i i had this situation yesterday a patient was covid positive two months ago subsequently had a negative test last night was coming to the cath lab asymptomatic has a positive test has antibodies on testing what do you do I mean, do you... ID. <laughs> yes. I usually only do that when I need a discharge summary. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's the second indication. <laughs> well, to be honest, we haven't had that much here in Minneapolis, and it's been fairly quiet. Actually, we don't test everyone yet because the capacity is still not up to speed for everything. But in a case like this, I think many people take the conservative route and say, unless it's an emergency, as you were saying, maybe it's best to just take it easy, let them go back and bring them back. But it's a good point. I've had many people like this where they're positive again and again and again. They do it just fine. And it comes to question up to when are you going to be testing them and is it a good use of resources? I don't have the answer, but I think we'll be learning more about this in the in the years to come, in the weeks and years to come. Absolutely. It's a crazy time. I mean, I right. never thought that I would have seen this. America literally coming to a, a, a stop, right? Everyone's vacation plans, the kids' school, the, the hospital, the economy. I mean, it's been... It's really been an amazing, I mean, it's been the best and the worst of our country, I think we've seen. Look um, at the March. Time. I mean, yeah. you know, look, I, my in-laws were here when this started. They, they're from Houston. And they kept saying, oh, why don't we take your family to Houston to keep them safe? And I said, you just watch, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, this, it's a virus, you know, it's, it's coming. And, uh, and, and, you know, it, 
it's a bad shape down in the South right now. Yeah. It's amazing how much we know in medicine and healthcare and technology, but yet this, these type of viruses have been around for millennia and we literally are not, we have no, we, we have nothing to do about it. We just are just sitting here waiting and trying to ride it out and keep people protected. So it's amazing. Well, I do have a prediction though, you know, COVID will go away eventually, but coronary disease and structural and peripheral are going to stay. So better as well, just keep on learning how to treat those. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and on these lines, maybe we can go ahead with, um, you know, this drops the first presentation, which is about uh, integrating the case planning and complex PCI and economic considerations. So I did go ahead. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Adir Shroff. I want to thank you for inviting me to CDI 2020. And the title of my presentation is Taking Control, Incorporating Treatment Planning into Complex PCI and Economics. Epidemia, diabetes, hepatitis C, and moderate aortic stenosis who came to the emergency room with cough, shortness of breath, and abdominal discomfort, no chest pain. The exam was relatively unremarkable. He did have an, an elevated troponin on admission as well as a, a BNP. So during his angiogram, uh, you can see here he's got heavily, right off the bat, you can see very heavily, heavily calcified um, arteries with a moderate um, osteal left main lesion. Um, we did use femoral access uh, due to insufficient catheter length during his diagnostic procedure. We tried doing radial access and we, were, we had difficulty. Um, and we were planning to use uh, intravascular ultrasound imaging to help optimize his atherectomy and his intervention. Did initially me measure his LVEDP and noted it to be only 11 millimeters of mercury. Um, he did have a 22 millimeter LVAO gradient. In terms of the mid LED lesion, we did plaque modification with uh, five runs at 80,000 RPM. We did multiple predilations pre with a 2 0 and a 2 5 millimeter balloon, and then ended up putting in a 3 0 28 millimeter stent distally with a 3 5 32 millimeter stent proximally, both deployed at 16 atmospheres. Our attention to the left main lesion um, after doing IVIS, uh, which demonstrated a significant lesion, we went ahead and performed uh, orbital atherectomy again um, across that left main to treat the left main lesion. Um, and then we pre-dilated with a 3.5 millimeter balloon, stented with a 4.0 by 12, and post-dilated with a 4.5 millimeter balloon. And we did a post-IVIS to confirm that we had good stent apposition and good expansion, which we did. Um, so the patient had an uneventful recovery, was discharged uh, two days after this intervention, and then underwent uh, elective TAVR three months following. And so really, I think the important lessons that I've learned over my years now of being an attending is that when you're treating patients with severe calcified lesions, there's several technical factors that are relevant in that oftentimes these lesions respond very poorly to balloons. Um, they're often underexpanded or you get dissections, uh, which may or may not be significant, but certainly complicate your procedure. Uh, stent delivery and deployment are suboptimal to say the least. I remember many times struggling to deliver stents and always worrying about the stents coming off or um, being removed from their um, balloon delivery system while trying to get through a tortuous segment like in this patient's LAD. And then this the theoretical concern of, you know, is the drug going to be delivered that we are so interested in? Is it going to be delivered equally um, in these very tortuous, very calcified lesions? Uh, will drug delivery be impaired? 
I think certainly we have, I have observed longer procedure times and more procedural resources in these very complex patients when I, when I use a balloon only strategy. Um, and then not to mention issues with T, TVR and TLR in the future. And all of these things make me wonder um, if I'm going to be able, I, I probably could recoup my cost of atherectomy device after if I use all these extra balloons, stents, I have to put in multiple short stents. Um, here you could see in those in a very long lesion, we were able to deploy, deploy very large stents um, and cover the entire lesion with really a minimal amount of stent. Cost effectiveness model uh, with or uh, orbital atherectomy when the investigators compared um, a subset of the Orbit 2 population who were over 65 to a Medicare a cohort who had severe calcified lesions and it looked at cost and used a one-year um, pool data from the Horizons Acuity study for one-year outcomes. What they found was that there was lower initial cost and a lower length of stay at one day, which you can see on the in the graph on the right. continued to have uh, lower or less MACE events, uh, which led to less cost as well as improved health outcomes for the patients who underwent atherectomy compared to this historical uh, control population of the Medicare database. And then when you put those together, costs and effectiveness, you can see here on this on this graph that over here on the right side um, is where when you do many simulations of this cost effectiveness analysis, that the cost effectiveness ranges anywhere from a cost savings of around a thousand dollars per life year to at most a cost of around twelve thousand dollars per life year gained. Which for those of you who are are familiar with cost effectiveness studies, any 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 technology that costs less than $50,000 for a one year life year gained is considered cost effectiveness in our society. So this you know, technology, at least from this study, uh, demonstrates that orbital atherectomy is a very cost effective strategy. In, this is an analysis um, in a primarily rotational atherectomy uh, cohort from 2012 from the Nation nationwide inpatient sample where they looked at um, about 100,000 patients and compared atherectomy patients to non-atherectomy patients. And you can see that as you'd imagine, um, those patients who had underwent atherectomy had, had higher rates of complications, had higher rates of in-hospital death and complications, and had a slightly higher rate of vascular complications. And all this led to an increased cost um, in these patients uh, who underwent atherectomy. And so this is part of what we're all dealing with here is that um, there's a perception that patients who undergo coronary atherectomy is going to be, they're going to be an increased cost with those patients and potentially even have an increase in adverse events. Um, thankfully, I think due to a lot of uh, industry support as well as from the medical community, uh, we were able to increase the outpatient reimbursement from CMS for patients who undergo coronary atherectomy. You can see here for bare metal stent as well as drug eluding stents, uh, the 2020 Medicare national average payment is around $16,000. And so I think this has been a very helpful step in moving the field of atherectomy forward in that many of our, many of our outpatients are now able, um, you're able to um, recoup the extra cost of what the atherectomy device is and really allow the, the operator to give patients the best therapy that they think um, is indicated for their patient with calcified lesions and not be uh, concerned or not be as worried about the financial implications of that decision. Second case, uh, which is a 68-year-old Asian woman who had uh, exertional angina. You can see her, her diagnostic angiography with a five French system. Her LED, left main, circumflex were all normal. She had this heavily calcified, focal, severe, mid-RCA lesion. Um, and then so what we did here um, in this patient, uh, we used a six French system, uh, heparin again for anticoagulation. And given that this was the RCA in our early experience, when we transitioned away from the transvenous pacemaker for atherectomy, we, we began using aminophilin infusions, which we did in this, in this case. Uh, we had some difficulty delivering the um, atherectomy device to the lesion. And so we had to do a predilation with a 1.5 balloon, which wasn't really a big deal at all. Um, and then we did orbital atherectomy, two passes, no bradycardia, did a, a predilation and then delivered a 3.5 by 23 drug eluting stent and deployed it at a high pressure final result. Um, so we were quite happy with the result. And so really what's been kind of nice and in terms of an evolution of our practice is based on um, 
the outcomes we've been seeing with uh, with uncomplicated atherectomy, we've added uncomplicated atherectomy to our list of allowable criteria for same-day discharge. Under an hour um, at around nine in the morning, we observed her until around five in the evening and she went home and had an uneventful recovery, uh, same-day discharge. So you can imagine the impact of this on the economics and patient satisfaction of being able to do safe, high quality PCI um, and to be able to get people home in a very efficient manner. And so this slide is a little bit of an old slide, but really wanted to highlight the experience that we had at our university um, that we noticed that when we introduced orbital atherectomy in 2015, that we had an increase in overall atherectomy volume um, as well as as a percent of our PCI cases. Um, or, orbital atherectomy is our default system in our lab, but we have noticed an increased use of rotational atherectomy for selected cases, specifically osteolesions and instant restenosis. What we found is with this, with this device, we've had greatly improved efficiency, much quicker setup, need for pacing is nearly eliminated, and much less inventory issues. And you can see in 2014, we were losing around $450, $475 per atherectomy case. And then with the increase in reimbursement um, and the switch to orbital atherectomy, uh, we've actually had an operating margin uh, significantly positive since then. And that's been really helpful to me as a cath lab director and as well to our hospital. And we've been able to keep the clinical quality up as well. Treatment of coronary calcium is underutilized. It's associated with work, worse clinical outcomes and adverse economic consequences. Atherectomy is, a cost, of, is cost effective by improving outcomes and efficiency. And adjust, adjustment to the outpatient reimbursement for atherectomy has made it even more favorable to be used in the clinical setting. Um, it is important to adjust one's care pathway to really fully benefit from orbital atherectomy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adir. That was a wonderful presentation. And I think that's a, a very common question from people about uh, the economics and whether the cath lab makes money or loses money. But part of it, apart from the complications for me, is the time in the lab. Time in the lab is very expensive, considering how many people there are um, and, and just being in the lab and delaying other patients who are waiting for that. So that alone also is another factor, maybe not calculated in those models, but another important factor, efficiency is important. And it's not only for the patient's convenience, but also money and safety as well. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know, Ziad, any, any thoughts? I know that uh, everyone is very scrutinized these days with COVID and the crisis, but have you guys had any issue there? I think you're still muted. You can unmute yourself, I'm sorry. I think you're still muted. Uh, sorry, Manos. Yeah, you're, you know, atherectomy is pretty common in our institution. Um, we're, you know, sort of avid atherectomy performers. You know, we, I, I think uh, a couple things that uh, Adir touched on, I think are re very relevant. I virtually eliminated pacemakers here as well. And, you know, it's, it's not um, a small sorry, Jack, you might just hold, I think you have playing the video game, must playing the, the live stream for a second. Maybe hold that so it doesn't interfere with the sound. There you go, perfect. Uh, I don't think that's me. Is it? Oh, maybe it is. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, I think, you know, it's atherectomy has been commonplace for us here. Uh, and I think one of the things that Adir mentioned that was really valuable was, you know, eliminating pacemakers is not a small deal. We, we essentially completely eliminated pacemakers for orbital atherectomy. Um, and, and as you know, I've been working on this project called Oracle, where we've uh, measured the microcirculation in between multiple different um, runs. We've got a randomized trial. We've got a registry. And essentially, uh, the background behind that is that we noticed this anecdotally very early on, that if you used orbital atherectomy, you didn't need to pace. And so that, to me, was indicative that you might not be causing the microvascular dysfunction or the microvascular plugging that may be leading to this. So, you know, one less access, uh, less cost for the pacemaking device. Um, both are good things. And as you said, efficiency is very important. The faster you can set this up, get it performed, the less likely you'll have the hesitation from the staff, which is a major driver of how we perform PCI, like it or not. That's a great point. 
staff hesitation is a big thing that we don't really talk about and you don't capture that in trials. And you see like the big centers that do these are the trials. Those people are highly motivated to, to do all these procedures, whether they're speaking or they're in a trial, but like in the community, you see that people just don't want to be bothered with having to set these things up. And so that, that's an important piece. I think also the ease of setup and easy to deploy a device that helps as well. So that sounds perfect. So that uh, was a great presentation. I think uh, next, uh, Thiago, move to you. Um, okay. The presentation is going to be on advanced uh, orbital laserectomy technique in the LAD and the circumflex. And looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Great, uh, thanks, Manos. So this is an interesting um, uh, talk because when I first got asked to, to do it, um, they, I was asked by CSI if I could do a talk on uh, retrograde orbital atherectomy. And I said, well, you know, um, so you want me to give an endovascular talk? And they said, no, we, we want you to, you know, talk about the retrograde technique in orbital atherectomy. And I said, well, I'm not really familiar with that. So then they told me about it. And they said, you know, there may be a technique where if you advance the um, the crown on glide assist and sort of get the lesions coming back that there is some potential benefit to which you know quietly and nicely in my mind I thought that's a bunch of hogwash how can that make any sense until I tried it and so I gotta say I, I, I ate my word so this is my first case of uh, the advanced orbital atherectomy technique with retrograde so this is the patient uh, the diagnostic multivessel disease. Patient's got right coronary disease. You'll um, notice that there's a distal left main lesion. And we brought the patient uh, to the lab, did an angiogram, took them off because the syntax was high um, and uh, offered the patient surgery, but the patient decided to undergo a PCI. This is a ventricular gram. So uh, obviously a procedure that I think in the setting of normal ventricular function uh, could be done uh, potentially with support, but with the normal ventricular function, I think uh, I was comfortable doing it without, especially um, when using orbital atherectomy. Again, for the same reasons that I felt less likely that I was going to impact the distal vessel. So let's talk about the interventional strategy. I planned on doing a culotte. I was going to do an atherectomy of the LED and the circumflex. Ibis guidance of to determine the arc and length of calcium. Ibis guidance to determine my reference vessel size go ahead and do the atherectomies, rewire the LAD, pre-dilate the circ, pre-dilate dilate the LAD, confirm by IBIS that I had effective atherectomy, stent the circ, pot, DS to the left main, rewire the LAD, DS to LAD, pot, rewire, circ, KBI, final pot and IBIS. So it's, you know, it's a, a left main, so there's a lot of work involved. So let's start with this IBIS. I think this is valuable. So this is the patient's LAD. And so while we're pulling back, you can see that the distal LED is pretty good. Now we're starting to come into a segment of disease. Uh, there's some eccentric calcification and uh, there's a diagonal branch over here. And as we continue to go back, more calcium, but all eccentric, not really anything that's alarming, not 180 degrees, but there you see a calcified nodule, the first one. So you see this spicule sort of spit sticking out. And now you see another segment right there of the proximal LED that's heavily diseased, and this is our left main. So if we took a cl close look at our LED, we see the distal reference is normal. It's 3.4 by 3.5 millimeters. So uh, we're gonna round down to a 3.0. There's a severe concentric calcification in the distal left main, and the proximal reference uh, is uh, displayed. So we go, go ahead and we do an LED uh, um, wiring. And you can see we used a Viper wire advance with the flex tip. We did three runs on low speed, two runs on high speed, but we didn't do any post dilation because I wanted to prevent the sections because I had to pull this wire out, right? So I left it, I performed an atherectomy, but didn't post dilate, pulled the wire. And so I like this uh, because look at this Viper wire uh, flex tip. I mean, Normally with a rotor wire, we'd have to come out, exchange, go back in. But all I did here is pull back my Viper wire and just go straight into the circumflex and advance it into the obtuse marginal without really any difficulty. So it saved a step and I think it's really shows testament to how good the Viper wire really is. Okay, so the next step actually is to talk to you guys a little bit about Viper wire. 
I think um, outside of the engineering, the real key is unlike a rotational atherectomy or rotowire, this thing can really move. And apart from it being sort of 360, it works pretty much like a nitinol tipped wire. Okay, so, um, you know, conventional hazards for lesion crossing uh, is the thought that when we are in an extremely eccentric lesion that we might actually come off target, perform atherectomy in the left main, we might get buckling of the OAS while we're advancing the crown, uh, both of which can be potentially problematic. And so there's this new feature on uh, the orbital atherectomy system, probably a couple years old, called Glide Assist. And so Glide Assist is really a very slow, um, low speed, spinning that allows you to move along the length of the wire very smoothly. And as a result, um, it, it really lets you get into positions where you otherwise couldn't by just pushing uh, without performing atherectomy. And so this is my first uh, attempt at retrograde CSI. So I'm advancing the orbital atherectomy system on glide assist past the lesion. And then I'm very slowly performing the atherectomy retrograde while hugging the inner, inner curvature without buckling. So this is a slow pullback on low speed uh, that's actually catching uh, the vessel. And this is one of the advantages of orbital atherectomy, and that is that you can perform atherectomy in two directions, uh, both forward and backwards, because the entire crown is covered um, with uh, atherectomy type um, material. And so let's take a look now at the IVIS from the, from the circumflex because I believe that the uh, proof is in the pudding. So what we did here is you can see that the catheter, the IVIS catheter is now pushed a little bit into the wall and the orbital atherectomy works exactly like this. It works in a wire biased band. But what you'll see is now that we're getting closer to this nodule, you're gonna see that I basically cored a hole in it, right? And so that's exactly what I wanted to do by hugging the inner curvature, I've ended up making a lot of space. So look at that. That's basically exactly the shape that the orbital atherectomy occurs. So I've essentially shaved off this nodule. And now I've got effective debulking. I know my distal and proximal reference vessel, so I can start dilating. So we do a pre-dilation with a 3515 in the circumflex. We do use the same balloon in the LED. And if we compare the pre and the post, Look at the difference in the atherectomy in the calcified nodule in the pre-PCI LED, which is the third from the right on the top, and the third from right on the bottom. So you can see we've made a significant amount of space by performing this atherectomy. And then what we do is go ahead and perform our PCI. So the pre-dilation allows us to use IVIS co-registration. The IVIS co-register is exactly where the stent should be placed. We go ahead and perform our 3528 DES. We then do a pot, we pre-dilate with a 4.5 by eight. We do IVIS co-registration in the LED and then go ahead and place our LED stent, another three five by 28. And then we do serial post-dilation for optimization based on our free PCI sizing. And finally, we do a pot with a four five eight and do a kissing balloon inflation and a final pot. And then if we go ahead and look at our final IVIS, you're gonna be able to see that we've gone from a minimal luminary of around two to a minimal stent area of about 6.3. And that osteocircumflex would have had that calcified nodule is now sort of completely freed. And the reason is the stent has sort of dug into this area in the area that we performed the atherectomy. So this was really a very pleasing result. And I think, again, the proof here is gonna be in the angiogram which shows that we put in two very large size stents. We were able to essentially eliminate that calcified nodule and have almost no underexpansion in that segment. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Yeah, This is um, a great example of multiple things. I mean, first of all, the wiring, I mean, I agree with the flex tip, um, the Viper flex tip that really has made a big difference. You know, I must say myself, I used to always microcatheter, workhorse wire switch for the Viper. And since it came out and I tried it now, I routinely wire directly with this and it works, uh, it works very well. So that saves several steps, saves time, uh, saves radiation and contrast and all these things. And then I love also the, obviously the imaging guidance. I think that's critical obviously for left main, but for any complex PCI, especially calcified to make sure it, it works. 
Uh, Adir, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I really appreciated the very meticulous planning. I think it's a great way just to keep keep track of what we're doing and just making sure that are you closing off any future issues by what your upfront strategies are. I think whenever I think of that, you know, on occasion you find, well, if I do this, then this is going to box me out later for this other potential option. So I think really having it very clear, it's helpful for the staff as well when you when they know what the what the plan is and what the roadmap is. So I think it's just a wonderful example of how to do a complex PCI and make it look like an everyday type A lesion um, through your approach. Well, that's a concerted effort for us <clears throat> to sort of protocolize things. You know, if you think about, um, for those of you guys who do TAVR, you go and do a TAVR, they plan everything before, right? They know exactly what they're doing, what balloon, what size, what access, whether they're going to put a Sentinel in, and we don't do that for PCI. Yeah. And so if you go and watch their procedures, it can be very smooth. We can do the same thing in PCI using imaging guidance. So I had a strategy and then followed the imaging guidance to help us know what strategy to use. And then, you know, guys, I was really impressed. I was not a believer in this retrograde technique until I tried it. And now it's my routine. And I do believe that as you hug the inner curvature, when you turn on the atherectomy device, it prevents buckling, prevents damage to the left main or, or to the lesion, and really creates a guttering inside that calcified nodule that can be very effective. I, I, I might have missed it, Ziad, if you mentioned this, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll have to, sometimes I need to glide assist through the lesion on the way in, because sometimes if you're just trying to deliver it to do the retrograde, you know, on the pullback uh, cutting, um, I think sometimes it's challenge, challenging to get the device through a tortuous segment. So having a little bit of, of sort of spin on the device helps decrease some of the friction to get the device down past the, the lesion, and then you can turn it on full and bring it back. And that's what yeah. I, that I've used. And actually, I, do, I mean, my understanding, because I, I think the Japanese were doing this originally, my understanding is, is that is actually the technique. And that is you cross the lesion on glide assist so that you don't buckle into the main vessel you don't get off target damage and that you're you're really not going away from the atherectomy because i think in some ways when you're going in with atherectomy and you're pushing it's going to go to the opposite wall probably going to stop you from getting stuck and also when you're hugging the inner curvature and you turn it on the way back it's a, it's a a much deeper cut I think another lesion where this is very useful, actually, even before it became more mainstream, for osteo lesions, they don't want to do orbital going in because you may have an uncontrolled orbit and create an osteo dissection. But doing it this way, and as Adir was saying, maybe glide assist can help you get through if it's a tight lesion, that can really streamline things. There was one question that came up uh, from the live question about the uh, aminophilin. People were asking, do you give it before or do you give it during? Uh, Adir, how do you guys use aminophilin? Or you don't use it anymore, but I guess when you do. Oh no no we still we still use it quite often. Um, I I usually give it as I'm going up with the device and as I'm getting getting it ready to go. I don't think it has to be going exactly when you're doing the the case, but you do want it sort of around it. So what oftentimes what I'll do is as I'm delivering the device up and I'm setting up in you know as I'm setting it up, I'll have them go ahead and give the drug. So it's like within two to three minutes of when I'm going to do do the work. I don't know if if you guys have any different okay. advice. Well, usually for us, the, the limiting factor is getting it from the pharmacy because yeah. the pharmacy has to prepare it. So that's like 10 minutes delay there. So for me, as soon as it gets up, we'll give, give it usually over five, 10 minutes. And then it does have a half, a half life of like eight hours. So once you give it, you're good for several hours to go ahead. But the challenge is if you delay, you get it after you've started a therectomy, then you, know, you may get the, the bradycardia because you didn't have enough time for the medication to take effect. Yeah. But it is a useful, uh, a useful adjunctive. Now I must say with Orbital, we use it less so. And in a way, personally, lately, I've been trying to use it less and actually look at the deceleration, the heart rate during a, um, a thorectomy. Because if you see a lot of deceleration, uh, almost like bradycardia, maybe that means that you were pushing too hard or going too fast or uh, too long um, um, duration of runs. And then this well, way, customize the runs. You know, I want to mention something on, the, on that note, Manos, because, you know, if you pay attention to the hemodynamics while you're doing the atherectomy, you can really make this very safe. And so... You know, we, we don't use um, sort of any aminophilin. What our routine in the cath lab is, before we start performing atherectomy, we sort of yell out the blood pressure and the heart rate to the nurses so that they know what it is. We start performing atherectomy. If the patient has a pause, we stop. If not, we keep going. 
And then we're just, you know, ex we give the patient a rest in between the runs. And by doing that, we really haven't required any adjuvant, you know, treatments at all. Perfect. And I think, you know, exactly the, the key thing, as you say, is being vigilant. And if something happens, if you catch it early and you stop the, the process, then it reverses it. But if you don't, and then you do it for longer, then that's when bad things could potentially happen. So being vigilant for this or any anything else we do, really, and um, I, that's the key part. You know, Manus, I really believe that the increased flow rate that's coming out of the OAS really helps that, right? It's four times the flow, for example, of the rotoblader. And so if you have four times the flow, you're really flushing out all that material. And, and I, I, as I said, I believe that's the mechanism for why we see less pacing. You're flushing out all the debris. And if you think of the rotoblader like a football and you have a lesion, it's stuck in there. So when you finally liberate that, it all kind of sends the debris down together, which may be why, you know, there, even the, the data supports that there's more um, a need for pacemaker using uh, rotational versus orbital. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely, completely agree. And again, it's all about the planning. Actually, I must say, we still give a little nicardia pain before we do any arterectomy down the vessel, just in case, but I agree the extra flow does help prevent the bradycardia. That's other. a great point, Manos. Uh, I think that's... Um, uh, something that's not done enough. I think if you have a very heavily diffusely diseased vessel and you think you're at risk of slow flow or no flow, there's really no harm in giving a little drug to the microcirculation to prepare it. That's great. All right, perfect. So we'll move ahead. Um, next, uh, I will make uh, a presentation on calculated approach to tight lesion management. This is a variety of things, the flex tip uh, as well as the uh, Sapphire 1.0 as well as a telephone microcatheter. This is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting today on advanced coronary techniques and some specific calculated approaches to treating a variety of tight lesions. My disclosures include honoraria from CSI, and I would like to start with reviewing the basic concepts of orbital atherectomy, and probably the most important one is the importance of going slow, specifically for using a slow advancement speed of about one millimeter per second. This video illustrates that there is much better debulking of the target lesion when the advancement is slow versus when it's done in a fast manner. And the result is with slow advancement a much better preparation and debulking of the target lesion with much less preparation in case of fast advancement. So going slow essentially is going fast, advancing slow is critical for better debulking and better lesion preparation. But it is not only important for the lesion preparation, but it's a safer technique too. This video illustrates what happens when we're advancing very fast to the lesion. When the crown reaches the distal end of the lesion, there can be this jump forward, which can cause distal damage of the target vessel. And this can be avoided by going slow. Also, by going fast, there is the possibility of stopping under great flow and therefore increasing the risk of distal uh, embolization and no reflow. So going slow provides better preparation, less risk for distal embolization, and it's safer with less likelihood of causing problems. The lesion is crossed slowly. There remains flow throughout the time of preparation. And this is illustrated uh, more in this graph, in which in green is what happens if the crown is advanced at a speed of one millimeter per second. This is at 80,000 RPM, and this is at 120,000 RPM. It actually uh, advancing at one millimeter per second at low speed of 80,000 RPM is much better than advancing fast at 10 millimeters per second at high speed of 120,000 RPM. Actually, in most of uh, my cases personally, I do use uh, the 80,000 RPM and advance the crown very slowly. And I think this provides the best balance of efficacy in terms of lesion debulking, but also in safety in terms of avoiding no reflow and distal embolization as well as other complications. Another very useful feature of the orbital atherectomy system is the glide assist, which is a mode that is activated by pressing the 80,000 RPM button for a few seconds and then releasing. That button will start flashing. And then what happens is uh, that once the crown is activated, 
then it spins at 5,000 RPM, which is a very slow speed, does not provide lesion debulking, however, makes it much easier to advance the crown and the, therefore optimize the starting position of the crown before doing the actual debulking runs. So something very useful to use, examples are ostia lesions, where we want to actually perform a therectomy coming back. Another example is when we have difficulty advancing the crown because of tortuosity or lesions more proximal to the target lesion. Discussing these basic concepts, we'll now go over some interesting cases that illustrate techniques for overcoming challenges. The first case is that of an elderly man who presented with cardiogenic shock. He was found, he was found to have multivessel coronary disease with CTOs and three vessels. He was placed on a balloon pump that was successfully weaned off, and then he was found to have viable myocardium but MRI, and he was sent for high-risk PCI after he was turned down for coronary bypass. Coronary angiography shows significant calcification, severe multivessel coronary artery disease. There has been an impella in, which we'll discuss in the next slide. Before performing complex PCI, especially in patients with low ejection fraction, performing right heart catheterization is extremely useful to determine baseline hemodynamics and the need for hemodynamic support. In this particular patient, wedge pressure was 26, and we decided to use an Impella hemodynamic support device. However, it was very challenging to insert it because of significant disease in the left iliac artery. Uh, as a result, we placed a stent, and then uh, after placing a stand in the iliac artery, we were then able to advance the impella sheath uh, through that um, area of tortuosity. That was an ICAST 8 by 38. And after doing that, we were able under fluoroscopy advance the impella sheath and then uh, deliver the impella device um, into the left ventricle without any problems. We decided to target the LAD, which was a large area of ischemia on MRI that was also viable. It did have a significant disease. You can see that visualization is overall poor, but there is calcification. There is an occlusion in the mid portion of the LAD after the takeoff of a large diagonal vessel. And then uh, the plan here was uh, to uh, perform undergrade wire escalation. We did uh, use uh, a microcatheter and um, we were able finally to advance uh, a guide wire down to the distal LAD. The problem was that after that we were unable to advance anything including a microcatheter, the Caravel and the Turnpike LP as well as a Sapphire Pro 1.0 which is our go-to balloon for balloon and crossable lesions. So that was a problem and we failed even though we did use a guide extension as well. So what are we doing in these cases? This is a challenge here. The next step could have been to use laser or to use a therectomy, but the problem with a therectomy has been that uh, we need to advance a microcatheter first for delivering the specific atherectomy wire, whether it's the Viper for orbital or the uh, rotor wire for rotational atherectomy. However, now we do have a new type of Viper wire, the Viper wire advance with flex tip which is a nitinol wire that has excellent torquing characteristics and it's much more flexible than the standard Viper wire. And we decided to try to see if we were able to cross that uh, heavily calcified lesion with that wire and actually we were pleasantly surprised that the wire did cross without too much difficulty all the way down to the distal LAD. So this is an example where we did not have to use a microcatheter to exchange our workhorse guide wire for the Viper wire, but instead we used uh, primarily the Viper wire. We then did uh, multiple runs of orbital atherectomy, following which we were able to advance the turnpike LP past that mid LAD all the way to the distal LAD. And then after delivering the microcatheter, we were able to exchange for a standard workhorse guide wire. The patient did have a transient increases into the pulmonary artery pressure, which is another useful uh, feature of having a Schwann GANS in throughout the procedure. That was likely due to slow flow in the diagonal branch. Uh, we were able to rewire the diagonal branch with a Sion Black guide wire and dilate it with a 2.0 millimeter balloon, and that restored undergrade flow despite the presence of significant calcification. 
Following this, uh, we were able to perform multiple balloon inflations. It was still pretty challenging to advance stents. And we know that there are many ways to facilitate the stent delivery, including better guide support, use a variety of wires, including body wires or extra supportive wires, use uh, um, different uh, equipment to modify the lesion, either with balloon angioplasty or with a therectomy, use different balloons and stents, and have the patient take a deep breath. Eventually, we were able to deliver um, two uh, synergy stents that have excellent um, low profile and high deliverability. And after doing that, we were able to achieve uh, a nice uh, uh, result. Uh, an additional stent was placed uh, more proximally, a Zion stent. And then we did have a nice final result with Timothy flow in the LAD while uh, still having flow into this large diagonal branch. Because the PA pressure was high, we left the impella in, but then that was removed the following day and the patient did have a good recovery with plans for follow-up PCI. So many interesting lessons from this case. The first one is the use of hemodynamic support guided by right heart catheterization. The importance of uh, preserving large side branches like the diagonal in this case. And then a novel way for approaching balloon uncrossable lesions, which is uh, by using an upfront wiring with a Viper wire flex tip. Case number two. This was a patient with previous coronary bypass graft surgery who uh, presented uh, with significant angina that was due to a significant distal left main bifurcation lesion. This was very challenging to approach. Femoral access was used and wiring of the LED was extremely challenging, but eventually using a twin pass dual lumen microcatheter as well as a filter FC guide wire then we were able to wire into the LAD. Given it was a true Medina 111 bifurcation, the plan was to perform bifurcation standing using a two-stand DK crash technique. So the workhorse wires uh, were used to exchange for the field RFC, and then we pretilated both the circumflex as well as the LAD. There was good expansion, intravascular ultrasound uh, was done, showing that there was no circumferential calcification. We also used a plaque modification balloon. And then that uh, uh, provided a nice result with um, some dissection happening into the circumflex. Again, the IVUS showed non-circumferential calcification. There was this circumflex dissection that had to be stented. So we started using the circumflex as the side branch. We did place a drag eluting stent covering the area of dissection, protruding into the left main. That was deployed, and then uh, it was crushed using the balloon that was placed already into the LED from the left main. And then the circumflex was rewired. But then the problem was we could not advance any equipment over it. We tried. Uh, uh, different uh, balloons that was not successful but eventually the success was achieved with a one millimeter sapphire pro balloon which has become the go-to balloon for balloon and crossable lesions in bifurcation setting but also in other settings as well after doing that we were able to then insert a larger balloon and then perform the first kissing balloon inflation into the circoflex as well as the left main and then we placed the stand into the left main the stand was deployed, there was rewiring to the circumflex, final kissing technique, and proximal optimization technique, and then uh, a final good result was achieved that was confirmed by intravascular ultrasound with Timothy flow in both the LAD as well as the circumflex. So this case shows the importance of having different techniques, both for rewiring the vessel, in this case uh, a dual microcatheter was successful, but also using a low-profile balloon such as the Subfire Pro when the balloon, a standard balloon, cannot cross after crossing of the stent strut. And finishing up with uh, another case, uh, this is a case of a right coronary artery, chronic total occlusion, in a patient with significant symptoms that refused bypass and was referred for percutaneous coronary intervention. It was a flush osteal right coronary occlusion. Um, there were um, some septal, not very well developed, but a good epicardial, apical LAD collateral going to the right posterior descending artery. We decided to first try undergrade, as is our usual approach uh, in uh, most lesions, to minimize the risk, but unfortunately this was unsuccessful. 
That is why we decided to attempt a retrograde through the epicardial collateral, delivered a teleport microcatheter next to the collateral, which was large, but did have a lot of tortuosity. We were fortunately able to wire through the tortuosity using a SUO or three guide wire that successfully went through those two loops. And then we had concerns whether the microcaster would follow, but actually the microcaster did a great job with a slow advancement with mild rotation. It did take uh, the bends and went through both the first and the second 360 degree loop. Uh, fortunately, there was no ischemia, which is always a concern when crossing tortuous large epicardial collaterals and uh, we were finally able to advance the microcatheter all the way to the distal vessel. This we'll see in the second, once that happens, there is some straightening of the loops and uh, the microcatheter essentially releases into the vessel. So once again, second 360 loop, microcatheter gets through and now there's a little straightening of the uh, loop and the wire goes forward. Distal injection demonstrated a well-defined distal cap, which was fairly challenging to cross, but eventually after undergrade and retrograde techniques, we were able to perform guide extension reverse guard, externalized an R350 guide wire, and then placed stents all the way from the proximal to the distal right coronary artery, achieving a nice final result with T3 flow into the right coronary artery, and the patient did have a resolution of the symptoms. I'm going to stop over here. Essentially, there are different cases showing different challenges, but having the necessary equipment and techniques can help overcome all these challenging situations. Thank you so much. All right, so thanks again. Um, great presentation so far. There's uh, one question that came up, uh, maybe for Ziad first and then for Adir. And this uh, has to do with the retrograde um, atherectomy versus uh, going the regular undergrade. The question was, um, what are the advantages you say about the safety? But the question was, do you use it routinely now in all your cases, or do you go back and forth to the standard undergrade uh, um, atherectomizing versus going retrograde? I, I just use retrograde now. I did another um, case a couple of, couple of days ago, and I, I used the same approach. I'll approach the lesion cross it on glide assist and perform my first set of atherectomies uh, retrograde on low speed. In fact, once I cross on low speed coming back, you know, retrograde, I'll actually go back on glide assist the first couple of times so that I don't buckle into the main vessel, into the left main or into the proximal LED. And then once I see that I'm hugging the, the really hugging the inner curvature, then I actually do some high speed runs. Um, but this is my default approach now. And uh, so far, you know, if, if we step back a second and think about specifically calcified nodules, I mean, the outcomes for these calcified nodules are atrociously bad. And, and the reason is the rotoblader usually just spins right past it, right? It's, it doesn't orbit. And I uh, have done studies which show that if, in, even in cases where I've used rotational atherectomy, the wire bias kind of pushes it away. And you really kind of need to sit there in order to get some of this calcified nodule ground down, or as Richard Shalafitz likes to say, give it a haircut, which I need, but that's a different story. Um, so I, I do think that uh, the retrograde technique has some real merit. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a believer now where I wasn't before. Yeah, I, I'm, I I'm, yeah, I'm still an, an anagrade is my my default approach. Um, I think primarily is that I'm trying to keep it simple for the fellows too that I'm working with. That when we're doing rota and we're doing CSI or over orbital, that the approach is very similar. Um, except in these unusual situations when there's a lot of tortuosity, or I'm trying to make a relatively sharp bend, and then I'll sort of bring out the retrograde technique as a as a thing that you can do just with CSI's device and not. That's right with the rotor device. You know, dear, I, I'll just uh, mention one more thing, Manos, just to be clear. I only do these for sort of bifurcation angulated lesions. Okay. I, don't, I don't think that the retrograde, if you have a straightforward tight lesion in the LAD, that you try to sneak across it up with a glide assist. I mean, that'd be kind of silly. So uh, I think this is really for angulation to prevent some of the things that we've seen in the past where you get that guttering and you end up kind of basically tearing the artery at that segment. Um, I think this can prevent that. Yeah, so to clarify for the for the audience, I guess this is again not for every case, 
but especially bifurcation, especially a lot of virtuosity, and then we do want to avoid having just the eccentric effect and having a deep cut, so to speak, in part of the artery. Now, in Thanks, a different year. Yeah. I think Ziad, Ziad made a really nice point in the last discussion, I think after his talk, where you know, if you sort of can think about, like when you push this device in, where is it, where is it gonna bias? And looking at the lesion, and where is it going to bias? And thinking about that when you're advancing, that might help you also. If 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 the you know if you're going to bias towards the relatively normal part of the, the vessel, that's really where the retrograde technique is really good, because it's going to change probably the contact surface of where the where you know where where the crown is going to hit or impact the vessel. And I think that's really what I try to think about. I try to show the fellows, hey, listen, we push, it's going to go like this. And I don't want it to touch that side of the surface. I want it to hit the other side of the surface, the other side, the, uh, the inner curvature. That's why I'm going to go retrograde and pull um, and do it on the way back so that I get more cutting on that side than I do on the other surface. And so I think trying to visualize it, I think is helpful. Absolutely. Um, another question that came out about the Subfire Pro and uh, the question, I mean, on the, on the case I just showed, it was actually the one millimeter Subfire Pro. And just curious on both of your thoughts, are you using the Subfire mats? Uh, has it uh, been useful to some of the complex cases that you are doing your daily practice? I mean, the one O balloon, when they came out with the one O balloon, I was sitting in one of those little sessions, you know, at TCT where they kind of take you in a small room and ask you what you think about the device. And I said, I said, I don't understand why you would ever make a one O balloon and not make anything else. But that 1.0 balloon now, after I tried it, um, it's incredible. It is a crossing machine. Like you can, it's like, I think the CEO of the company says it's what is it? Uh, no cross, no case. And like, they're going to get t-shirts made of that case. That thing will cross anything. It's really pretty amazing. And I don't usually get that excited about a device, but I've had many CTOs where I've not been able to cross with anything. And then that thing will go across and it's really saved my case for me. I've invested a lot of time and effort in a complex CTO case. And then to not cross is the worst thing ever. And then having this thing be able to get across um, has really been um, a game changer for me in many cases. I have the same experience. I remember this sort of, uh, again, uh, maybe I'm naturally a pessimist, but I thought, ah, you know, great. A 1.0, 1.25, what's the difference? And, you know, I couldn't get cross with a microcatheter. I tried like a series of microcatheters. I tried a fine cross. I tried a Caravel. Couldn't go, and here I come with this one o balloon, and boom, straight through. Yeah, and it's it's just it, it's it, it's now become a part of the algorithm for the uncrossable lesion, and it's pretty high up, right, uh, Manos? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Actually, you know, with the, it used to be that we're saying you know first try with a small balloon, but now it's tied with everyone with a one o balloon because that's the sort of lowest profile and it works most of the time. Therefore, as you said, why bother and put microcatheters and get the guideliner in? I mean try this first. If it doesn't work, then obviously we'll do the other things. Um, what we've seen is it works in many cases. There are some cases where actually ruptures, but it doesn't matter because if you get yeah. through and you balloon yeah. a little bit, then you can get your next balloon. So you're still, you're still coming ahead of the game. So this is not a high pressure balloon for complex leaders just to get you through and then get your regular uh, balloons to come, to come through. And I find that it's, you know, you can sort of nudge it in with, on angulated CTO lesions, for example, or angulated lesions where you've kind of got a bend in the mid RC, for example. You know, sometimes when the microcatheter is spinning and there's a little space, proximally it buckles, but this thing doesn't. You can kind of jam it in there and then uh, get your first inflation. It's it's actually a really nice technology. Yeah, I'm impressed. I didn't Do know. Do you use that. the over the wire, the monorail balloon usually? We've been using the rapid exchange. Okay. Do, you, uh, do, do you like the monorail better? Yeah, I think it has stiffer shaft. So for me, I know many people like the over-the-wire systems, you know, we do everything monorail, but I think specifically for this stuff to cross lesions, the monorail is a stiffer shaft and more penetrating yeah. actually than the over-the-wire. So actually you are, it's easier and I think it's more effective in crossing as well. So you just use a trap and then we'll trap it in and, and use the over-the-wire or you have an, a long wire? No, 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 I use the monorail. Yeah, monorail, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't use the, I mean, I trap to get the microcatheter out if it's a CTO yeah. or other lesion. And then I just use this over the, mon, I mean, regular yeah. monorail balloon. Yeah. But I, I don't like the personal, the over the wire as much because I think the monorail does a better job in being stiffer and, and more crossing that's, than the other wires. That's our experience too. Wonderful. Any final thoughts? Looks like we've come close to the end. Yeah, it's great cases. I really appreciate the opportunity. I think it was a really good discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the good news is that, uh, I've been um, uh, very impressed that CSIs continue to like sort of push the envelope and go into new areas. I think 
to be honest, orbital atherectomy now is sort of a household item most places. Um, it's quick, it's easy, everybody has it. You don't need like super training for it. And the fact that they're getting into these newer things like balloons, uh, you know, crossing catheters, guide support, these type of things, uh, you know, it's making a real portfolio because and the quality of their products is very good. Absolutely. And I think also the what at least I've seen myself is that the cases who come to the hospital now are fewer, but they're much more complex than before because you, they're really symptomatic or really terminal people come in. So actually, I've had many more complex lesions as a proportion now than I did before um, the COVID uh, hit in. So actually, if, more, if anything, now is the time to use the more uh, advanced equipment and imaging to get the best results. Well, if Manos, you're getting more complex cases now. I don't want to know what you had before. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it is uh, it is interesting. Life is always it never gets boring, right? That's the beauty of what we do. And it never uh, gets easier. Something. It never gets easier. There you go. Plus, you know, the, the more you can do, then the more you're going to try to do, right? So that's the nature of the game. Of course. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you both. I mean, it was a phenomenal discussion. Excellent cases, excellent presentations. Uh, thank you both. Would like to thank uh, CSI for supporting uh, this symposium and thank all the audience. So thank you so much. And the next session will be on the peripheral. Um, uh, program and starts at uh, 1.30 mountain time. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Thank you, everybody. Bye guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.